I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with this game. I finished it, that's a start. I couldn't even get around to finishing Baldur's Gate 3 yet, even though I'm very much enjoying my time. The people who know me might think this will be a giant teardown of the game. It's not. You can put the pitchforks down, people. Hogwarts Legacy is a perfectly decent adventure that any Harry Potter fan will enjoy. In fact, the game makes a great case for itself as a video game franchise. This video is just my takeaway from the game and what I hope for in a sequel. To start, everything I initially thought would be good about the game turned out to be bad, and everything I thought would be bad turned out to be good. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I'll explain. Don't worry now, I won't be spoiling the game or the story in any meaningful way here. I'll start by saying I was incredibly impressed with what this game brought to the table. The combat which I expected to be the weakest part was actually the most engaging part of the game. A tough challenge for developers when you think about using a wand that spells for combat. But they've cracked it here, mostly because they took the best elements from other action combat systems and simplified them. It plays very like a character action game, which you continue to cycle through a basic but snappy 3 hit combo, with the third hit dealing the heaviest attack meaning you always want to finish the combo. This builds a multiplier and makes orbs drop to increase the ancient magic meter which allows you to perform special damage dealing moves and you use your spells to cause special status effects, damage or a bit of both, all while you dodge or shield yourself away from counter attacks and spells. The drip feed of new spells and upgrades you'll earn by leveling throughout keeps the combat from becoming completely stale by the end. The enemy types on the other hand doesn't have the variety needed for the length of the game. You'll be sick of fighting spiders, trolls and everything in between by the time you see the credits. Mixing and matching enemy types could have helped but it's a rarity to see. The dark wizards could have made up for this and the bones of it are there. One wizard will use summons, another shocks the floor below you, the wizards high up try to snipe and bind you and others transform into wolves but the different shield types mean you want to keep a variety of spells on hand. However, the actions you perform will be the same. At most, you will break a shield, stun lock, deal damage and just rinse and repeat. Here's where a little genericness probably would have benefited the combat. I'm thinking of simple things like a wizard who buffs and heals his other companions, casts a shield perhaps on weaker enemies, requiring the player's main focus, wizards that perhaps go for a disarm, making you run across the arena to retrieve your wand. Look, it's not the best ideas I know, and it could be annoying, but there is more than enough ways to deal with bothersome enemy types in this game, and I give the combat system credit for that. Forgive these spell pronunciations by the way, but being able to avada cadavra an annoying enemy type is one of the later combat's best features, and by the time you get the spell, you've already killed your fair share of each enemy. Lots of enemies cause mayhem on the screen, making it difficult to see the counter or danger symbol above your head, and enemies can get multiple hits in as you can become stun locked for a few seconds due to the taking damage animation, easier to spot on the harder difficulties, and enemies become quite spongy. To be fair, the mayhem is half the fun of the combat. On the flip side, the game tends not to kill you on no health, instead allowing one more hit, meaning it's easy to heal up after taking mortal damage and since health potions are so readily available and can be popped at nearly any time, the combat leans on the easy side. Bumping up the difficulty doesn't really help. In fact, playing on the hard mode tends to negate the effectiveness of most spells, so you tend to rely on the heavy damage dealing ones, and it doesn't really make much sense either. The story sets up you're one of the generation's most powerful wizards, and the normal difficulty fits that expression the best. <laughs> I am often shocked on what port key games get about the Harry Potter franchise, and even more surprised by what it doesn't. For example, there are rideable mounts in the game, even though the broom makes them quite redundant. Still, it was a great decision, since they knew people would want to ride beasts in order to live out the fantasy. This shows they really get what people want. This brings us to Hogwarts, which is close to a walk of art. You can't walk a few meters without something catching your attention. It's full of references and easter eggs. It's hard not to get lost in for the first few hours of the game. You know something is great when all you want to do is look around and ignore the story. It's confusing and easy to get lost in, remaining true to the book, yet thanks to the map and the fast travel, 
The riddle to its layout is a puzzle that really only needs to be solved once. They give the players the three unforgivable curses, which sort of break the challenge of the combat by the end. They do it because they knew people would want to use them. It even allows you to collect all the beasts, feeding, breeding and maintaining them. It's overly simple for what it is, and really only serves to provide upgrade materials, but I think people would have done it anyway, without the incentive, because people just want to live out the fantasy. Still, it was a solid implementation. The customization for both yourself and the room of requirement. This means you'll scour every part of the map for all the gear. You'll go out of your way to complete the field guide to 100% just so you can unlock the unique pieces. The franchise fans are very much about dressing up and looking the part and the developers get this as well. And the fashion at the time where the game is set blends together quite well with wizard fashion. And being the best equipped and looking the way you want is simple thanks to being able to make any piece look like one you've previously obtained with just a few button presses. I went in blind and there were so many moments where I was like, no way they put this in the game? And it's not just the fan service that I enjoyed. The two biggest compliments I can pay to the game is how well it plays and the music. Modern AAA games often get praised for their realistic graphics. Now, although on PS5 I exclusively played on performance mode, there was no denying for the majority the game looks the part. Facial and character animations are mostly weak outside of cutscenes. That's more than excusable given the mostly high fidelity of the game's graphics. The hustle and bustle of Hogsmeade and Hogwarts was something that's nearly always going on. And this attention to detail can be seen in all the creature animations when you feed and pet them. So a few blank NPC interactions are more than acceptable considering the game's scope. My personal favourite thing about modern AAA games is how easy it is to just hop in and go. Everything is easy. Hogwarts Legacy is no exception. It just plays so well. It takes a few seconds to hop on your broom and a button press to find the task you want to do. A brief moment to fly over and often it's just one button to start the objective. And the ease of use just continues. If the objective is too far, you can fast travel relatively close, and the quest markers mean it's almost impossible to get lost. Swapping spells on the go is easy. Now although I never like a mouse-like cursor for consoles, when it comes to swapping spells it makes a great case for itself, by how fast and simple it is. With the great UI helping in this regard as well. The colour coding for logos and spells and gear makes everything readable, hassle free, and just flat out easy going for any player. Next to music, I am not by any means a music expert, but I can honestly say that the game's music, in my opinion, outdoes the film. Obviously the film built the groundwork that this soundtrack draws from, still there's more of it and more to play with, a luxury the movies didn't have just to be fair to the film soundtrack. Regardless, the variety and soundscape are better. Everything in the game, even the mundane stuff, is given a real jolt of energy thanks to the music. The room of requirement it's practically the room of busy walk, yet the music gives it a life it otherwise wouldn't have. Personally, I would put the music up there in my top game soundtracks. Let's look at the other side of things. Look, I'm not going to criticise the game for not being able to achieve everything, because it's just not realistic. So the fact that Quidditch is not in the game is understandable. Quidditch was a narrative device first and foremost, which most people tend to forget. In truth, it does not stand up to strict scrutiny in terms of logic and fairness. So the sport would require some serious rule changes to function in a way that felt competitive. With everything else the game tries to achieve, it's not reasonable to dedicate all the time to this. Another would be the fact your house choice doesn't add much. A different common room and robes. One quest will have a slight variation to it, and you can talk to some characters early. Look, I appreciate even that little effort was made, however, that's the extent of it. I expect much more in a sequel no doubt, because the more you add, the more variety, uniqueness and replay value you're giving the game. Reward people for going back for another round, and another round, so it's well worth putting development time there. I'll admit seeing the house points hourglasses will definitely leave fans with some dissatisfaction. As is, at least for the first outing, I can let it go. Wizard's chess on the other hand seem very achievable this time round. It's just chess with some fancy animations involved. I'm picturing a Gwent situation here 
where you try to beat everyone for some wizard card collection or something, unlocking unique looking gear. You could even use magic to cheat for players who just wanted to complete it. In all honesty, most people would probably ignore it, so I'm not too torn up over it that it's not in the game, this time at least. While I can accept those decisions, here's where we come to some bizarre choices that the developers make. There's a dueling arena that serves as a tutorial throughout the first part of the game. I was expecting challenges and eventually one-on-one -on -one duels with the best wizards in the school, perhaps even the teachers by the end. This is set in the 1890s after all, they weren't exactly known for their child's safety. Except it serves as a tutorial and is never used again. What a waste. Aloha Mora. This is a famous beginner spell that unlocks doors. This created a bit of a weird wrinkle in the law. Why does anyone even lock their door in the first place since even the most novice wizard can unlock it? Hogwarts Legacy addresses this problem by showing that locks range in difficulty and the harder the lock requires a more advanced version of the spell. This at least shows certain locks work on novice spellcasters. And I'm assuming the last level is a difficult spell to master since the level 3 locks are all over the most private parts of Hogwarts such as the teachers boardrooms. This should be a compliment in the game's favour, except despite being a magical world and the fact that using a spell, the game subjects the player to one of the dullest mini games I have ever played. This is where video game trends got the better of them, and they should have just stuck to the source material. All the RPGs have lock picking mini games, I can hear a seasoned developer shout. When doing the bare minimum, just having the spell working as intended, would outshine most other games with the same dull overused mechanic. This one literally has me scratching my head on how someone could get this wrong. Now to be fair to the game, very quickly you'll be unlocking the doors within 5 seconds. Still it's a needless inclusion and undermines the wizarding world as an IP for a video game. But the developers outdo themselves again with another stupid decision. Hogwarts, which is in the title of the game, gets mostly neglected after the first chapter of the story. Saying that out loud is maddening. Your most interesting place, an almost literal work of art, they made it so it can be mostly ignored. A lot of quests take place in mundane places outside the castle. And look, I've the sense to recognise why. Because Hogwarts is jam packed full of set dressings, yet has nothing meaningful going on. That's why nearly all classes, even at the beginning, are always pulling you outside the classroom. In my rough but generous estimation, I would say 30% of the game takes place in Hogwarts and 70% outside it. And the game's getting that on a technicality, because the rumour requirement is in Hogwarts and there's a few other places that you continually go to that I'm not going to spoil. The percentage should have been the other way around, or at the very least 50-50. And in order to even unlock the classes, you have to do a few tick the boxes quest lines. At the very least, you're rewarded with a new spell to try out. And with the exception to Hogsmeade, man, that open world is dull. It falls for the open world trap, where there's lots of content filling up the map, making it seem like there's loads of stuff to do. And boy, is there. The game wants you doing the most repetitive, lackluster, most blatant map filler I've seen in a while. To get everything you really want out of the game, you'll probably come to the 40 hour mark, however to reach completion, you'll probably come much closer to 70, and that time isn't made up by collecting beasts, no no no, it's all the stuff you did once and never wanted to do it again. I could accept all this if it wasn't for the game's most egregious fault. Most shamefully, you don't feel like a student in Hogwarts. Now I did not expect a magic student simulator by any stretch, but I'd argue the game doesn't even do the bare minimum on that front. Classes are cutscenes. I didn't buy Hogwarts Legacy to watch classes, I bought it to participate in them. The lack of interaction was all sacrificed for the multiple student quest lines. Long story short, Sebastian is the only interesting quest line in the game, and I go further and argue he might be the only interesting character. Well, that's at least fleshed out. In the beginning, he's little more than a rebel student. As time goes on, he slowly gets more desperate and is willing to take bigger and bigger risks. He's constantly trying to justify his actions to the player, which I'm not gonna lie I always thought was funny, since we're doing even crazier things left right and centre. It ends on an uncertain future for Sebastian. To be fair there are other characters that I think are interesting in the game, and with the right presentation could have shined. For one, Professor Fig. 
He's like the Dumbledore to your protagonist, except he constantly relies on us, who's also being mentored by four other characters, so he kind of fails as the tutor he's meant to be. In fact, the most interesting character might be the player. Why did we draw in Hogwarts so late? What is ancient magic's purpose and why can we use it? These are never truly answered, and maybe it's for the best. This all kind of ties in with the story, which I'm not going to spoil, because it's just okay and it doesn't warrant going in depth on. Feels like the first act stretched out to accommodate a 40 hour game. What's maddeningly, it only gets truly interesting after the ending, and then there's no more story left. There seems like so many missed opportunities here. I'm literally shocked there are not moments where we use Imperial on an enemy and control them to infiltrate areas, complete puzzles, and perhaps even use them for stealth takedowns. And that's to name one of many. And it's hard not to get frustrated by how promising everything was. The game sets itself up so well with not having to deal with the baggage of the Harry Potter franchise, and yet seems so hesitant to do anything interesting with that premise. Why unshack yourself from the books if you weren't going to trailblaze some new ideas? Look, I give the game credit for both playing into the stereotype that the goblins are evil with the villain, while at the same time redeeming them too. Well, at least a little bit with some of the side characters, something not present in the books. Gameplay wise, while solid, could have done more. When you move something with Accio and try to force it somewhere, it automatically turns into Wingardium Leviosa for easy movement. A great little convenience. I always think attacking is much more fun than defending, so being able to hold Protecto and counter with Stupefy means you can turn defense into offense with just the hold of a button. I would have taken this idea even further, refined and simplified more. Funny I think simplify sounds like a spell in the game. Anyhow, Accio and the Pulso, the pull and push spell respectively, could have been bonded together. Hold the button for Accio and tap for the Pulso. Now the hold might be a bit too slow for combat, so you could have had it tap for Accio and double tap for the Pulso, saving a spell slot. And there's a few others that you could do the same with, such as Confringo and Incendio. Some spells are so context sensitive, I don't even know why they're on the spell list, such as Repairo. Just have a button prompt at repairable structures. Don't tell me it's for puzzles. These ain't puzzles. It's broken, you repair it. It's a puzzle that solves itself. Or the room of requirement spells. Have a practice room where you fight dummies and can select spells, but while you're in the actual room, have the three spells you need, i.e. the place, remove and change, promptly on your hotbar. To wrap up, this game also had two controversies surrounding it. One before release, because of the author's views on trans people, leading to people verbally saying they are boycotting the game. Now, dig deep enough into any person's views long enough, you're going to find something you quarrel with. Beloved writers are no exception. The whole thing is bizarre, and I can't even give my viewpoint on the matter, because if my opinion is not and totally in line with the accepted hell view, it itself is controversial, whatever it might be. How developers take an IP and make a game out of it, which is a common occurrence in the industry, somehow has something to do with the author's views on trans people, is a connection people make that I just can't follow. Walt Disney and the Disney Company have a far shadier history, and yet I don't see anyone boycotting them. I only mention this controversy so I can explain the subsequent one. This game wasn't given a single nomination at the Game Awards, as not to drum up hate for the show. This to me seems like an obvious slight the Game Awards has made against its own industry, showing how little regard it has for its developers that make the medium possible, for someone's politics outside the gaming world. Comically, they justify why them themselves should be boycotted due to lack of integrity. It's a sad state of affairs and a stain on the industry for allowing the mob and politics to get the better of them. We'll leave that sour note and close off on the game. The books came from that childlike reality that amazing things can happen. There was wonderment and awe when Harry saw and experienced things we could only dream about. The game captures that. The music and moments combined had that child part of my brain saying, wow, I'm actually experiencing what it's like to be in this world. It's a great testament to video games as a medium. So for all its flaws and all the ways I wish it was different, there were truly moments of magic in this game. This has been Jamie on Hogwarts Legacy, and if you've made it this far into the video, 
I want to thank you for watching. I do not recall teaching you how to play like that. <laughs> <laughs>